Over the past few months, I've been working out a strategy to be able to help to explain scientific concepts, especially complex scientific concepts. And so I have been collaborating with Lumiantia, who in reality is my brother, who is just super talented at doing AI video version. So if you don't like that concept, I'm letting you know upfront that what we're trying to do is take some of the really important ideas that we have been building over the years and help it to be dissected so that people can understand it better. So all I want from you is a genuine observant review as to this really interesting scientific and historical story and whether or not we can use this approach to help to take some of the scientific questions that we've been working at about COVID, vaccines, spike protein, to help to delineate ways forward. So please, without further ado, I'll come back right after. It's about nine and a half minutes. So let's hear what you think about this story. Vanilla is everywhere. In our ice creams, our perfumes, at our celebrations. It's a flavor that enhances tens of thousands of food products, medicines, and cosmetics. But the commercial popularity of this ubiquitous spice has an extraordinary story. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés brought vanilla from Mexico to European courts in the 16th century, where it became the obsession of royalty and the secret ingredient in the finest chocolates. Queen Elizabeth I favored it in her puddings. Centuries later, Thomas Jefferson was so obsessed he hand-copied a vanilla ice cream recipe for America to taste. But without the native Melipona bees found only in Mexico, the vanilla vine refused to cooperate. In glass houses from Paris to London, the delicate white flowers would bloom for a day, then wither away without producing a single pod. The general consensus at that time was that vanilla production outside of Mexico was impossible. That is, until Edmund Albius, a 12-year-old enslaved child, proved them all wrong. 800 kilometers east of Madagascar, the tiny island of Réunion was famous for its sugar plantations and ferocious storms. On one of these plantations, the Bellevue Estate, a white planter had dutifully kept a vanilla vine alive for 20 years, but had never seen a single pod. Edmund was born into slavery in 1829. His mother died in childbirth, and at an early age he was sent to work on the Bellevue estate, where the owner, Ferriol Bellier Beaumont, became aware of his sharp mind and taught the little boy horticulture and botany. One day, as they walked the fields, Bellier Beaumont showed Edmond how to marry melon flowers, male to female, a lesson in the simple grammar of pollination. As he worked and studied under his master, Edmond was immersed in the cruel reality of plantation life. Slaves who fled were hunted down with dogs. Punishments were brutal, branding, mutilation, hamstrings cut for those who ran twice. Edmund never knew his father, as men often disappeared in those years to fever, the sea, and the iron discipline of a system that regarded African lives as discardable tools. One morning in 1841, Bellier Beaumont discovered two young pods swelling on his barren vanilla vine. To his astonishment, Edmund claimed that he had fertilized the flowers by hand. The planter <laughs> laughed at him. A few days later, more pods appeared, and a startled Bellier Beaumont demanded that Edmund show exactly what he had done. Bellier Beaumont later penned a letter. In the watermelon plant, the male and female flowers occur on different plants, and I taught the little black boy Edmund how to marry the male and female parts together. This clever boy had realized that the vanilla flower also had male and female elements and worked out for himself how to join them together. This is the trick that until then no farmer or scientist had achieved, yet Edmund had figured it out. 
At the heart of the vanilla blossom sits a tiny padlock, the rostellum, that keeps the flower from marrying itself. Edmund had lifted that flap with his thumb and pressed the anther to the stigma with a thin stick, a three-second procedure. Days later, the floral ovary thickened. Weeks later, vanilla pods emerged. News quickly spread. Within days, other plantation owners came to study Edmund's technique. The young boy was transported around the island, plantation to plantation, demonstrating his simple practical technique to fellow slaves and their astonished masters. <laughs> Using his method, workers could hand-pollinate hundreds of flowers a day. Since each flower opens only once, this technique quickly became the most efficient and reliable method for large-scale production. What followed was transformation. Overnight, vanilla became an extremely profitable commercial crop. In 1848, Réunion exported just 50 kilograms of cured pods. A decade later, two tons. By 1867, 20. And in 1898, a record 200 tons. By the late 19th century, Réunion was outstripping Mexico as the world's largest producer of vanilla. But why are we so obsessed with this particular flavor? Vanilla contains over 250 aromatic compounds. The star player, vanillin, crosses the blood-brain barrier and lights up our reward circuitry. It's the same dopamine hit we get from our favorite song, a warm hug, or completing a difficult task. Clever cooks have always sensed what neuroscience now confirms. Add enough vanilla, and you can cut the sugar by a quarter, while your brain still registers the same satisfaction. More flavor, less sweetness. Same pleasure signal. Today, almost 200 years later, the exact same gesture Edmund demonstrated is being repeated by farm workers millions of times each season. Vanilla cultivation is a multi-billion dollar industry and the economic cornerstone of Madagascar, Comoros, and Uganda. Profitable innovation spreads quickly. Unfortunately, recognition very often lags behind. In 1848, slavery was abolished on Réunion. Bélier Beaumont wrote to the government on Edmond's behalf, requesting a small pension for the young man whose discovery had created a new industry. The authorities ignored the letters. No pension came. Freedom brought little relief. Edmond scraped by as a laborer, later finding work as a kitchen servant in an officer's home. When the house was robbed, suspicion fell on him. Despite questionable evidence, he was convicted and sentenced to five years of brutal hard labor. It took the determined intervention of Bellier Beaumont and several other prominent men who remembered what Edmond had given the world to secure his early release. He was never properly credited or compensated for his discovery. In 1880, aged 51, Edmond died in a public hospital. The local newspaper noted, The very man who had great profit to this colony discovered how to pollinate vanilla flowers, has died in the public hospital at Saint Suzanne. It was a destitute and miserable end. Edmund Albius's legacy is more than just profit. For those struggling with evening <laughs> drinking, a habit that claims three million lives each year, sensory substitution can make a difference. A warm vanilla tea hits the same ritual notes, the steam rising, the familiar weight of a cup, that first comforting sip. It's not medicine, but it satisfies the craving for comfort and is a pleasurable alternative without the damage. Today, vanilla appears in thousands of medications, masking the bitterness of children's antibiotics, making chemotherapy drugs bearable which makes Edmund's fate all the more tragic. The boy who gave the world access to a healing tool died without access to basic health care in a public hospital, destitute and forgotten.
A few places in Réunion bear his name, a street, a school. There's a humble monument by a bus stop above the sea, but the truest memorial is the one that is still in motion. The quick lift of a flap, the press of a thumb, a touch of pollen dust, the long, slow darkening of vanilla pods. History celebrates the famous inventors, but progress often springs from many quiet, faceless ones, their gifts freely given, folded into human experience and built upon by future generations. Edmund Albius gave the world a gift worth billions, yet died forgotten and penniless. Today, Madagascar farmers still use his exact technique. Every scented candle, every birthday cake carries the story of how Edmund Albius's small black fingers flavored the world. Wow. So yes, I saw this and I was blown away by the story, the way how the AI was able to capture that story. And what I'm trying to understand is whether or not this can be used as a way to bring some of the really complex science that I'm talking about, where we have to take concepts, even from, say, Gert, with regards to the, the variants and so on. If we can use this kind of technology to help to delineate the science, I think that is very, very powerful. But yes, at the end of the day, this is not what I think. It's what you think that really makes a difference. So please, like, share, and comment. Help us to know if this is something that can really work for the longer term. Have a great evening. A hero, an immune adventure. Humming Heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon. Check the links below.